In Pennsylvania, anxiety disorders are the leading reason doctors approve patients for a medical cannabis card. Even though the evidence that cannabis is effective treatment for anxiety is limited and mixed. A Spotlight PA analysis found that in 2021, anxiety disorders were listed on more than 151,000 medical cannabis certificates. That's nearly 40% of the certificates that year. Anxiety ranked far ahead of chronic pain, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other conditions. In a comprehensive review by the National Academy of Sciences, a committee of scientists found conclusive evidence that cannabis was effective for treating chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. There was also substantial evidence that cannabis was effective treatment for chronic pain. But the evidence for cannabis as treatment for anxiety was weaker. The report specifically looked at the potential benefit of CBD because it doesn't produce a high and found limited evidence. The report also found a potential downside, stating moderate evidence that daily cannabis use is associated with increased anxiety. Anxiety was approved in Pennsylvania by the then state's health secretary, Rachel Levine, in 2019, after she carefully reviewed the literature. One of the reports was a white paper by research associate Susan Stoner. That's really her name. In her report, Stoner made a distinction between THC and CBD, saying that pure THC appears to decrease anxiety at lower doses and increase anxiety at higher doses. On the other hand, CBD appears to decrease anxiety at all doses. This story throws a bit of shade at the Pennsylvania regulators, suggesting that there may not be enough evidence to include anxiety as one of the qualifying conditions for medical cannabis. The author misses the forest for the trees. The state's real-world evidence demonstrates that anxiety is overwhelmingly the most popular reason for medical cannabis. Relying on traditional studies may not be appropriate for understanding the benefit, the therapeutic effects of cannabis. Traditional studies are designed to study single-agent pharmaceuticals, whereas cannabis is a variable multi-agent botanical. I know I hop on this point all the time, but the good people of Pennsylvania appear to have discovered what science could not. Despite limited traditional evidence, cannabis is overwhelmingly effective for anxiety. What's more, consumers are not using pure THC or CBD, but rather some combination of both, along with terpenes and other organic compounds. Studying cannabis requires a paradigm shift that has not yet occurred in the scientific literature. So does cannabis help with your anxiety? The answer may be complex for scientists, but for 40% of the medical cannabis patients enrolled in Pennsylvania, the answer is clearly yes. This is Dr. Jean Talleyrand with Hyatt 9 News. Dr. Wow. Jean, doesn't doesn't this match perfectly, though, with the studies on dronabinol, marinol, as it's commonly known, that the THC pill it is it, it creates uh, dysphoric effects in in many of the the consumers the the early tests with it AIDS and and cancer patients that they don't like pure THC uh, it it just seems to mimic the results of the pill variant of this study twenty years ago. You know, uh, well, first of all, the scientists studying uh, marinol or dronabinol, uh, which is isolated THC, um, consider the euphoria as an adverse effect, meaning so dysphoria, euphoria, you might like, you say tomato, I say tomato, you might like the euphoria, but somebody might consider it dysphoric. And, and so, um, you know, it's, it's really your perspective. Uh, and which is why they haven't approved it for anxiety. They've mostly approved it for um, for nausea uh, and then side effects, of course, for pain or muscle spasms and MS. But, uh, you know, the people are saying, first of all, we don't like Marinol. You know, I, I have patients that I could prescribe Marinol to, and they overwhelmingly choose the flower rather than, than the pill, which is why I'm not so worried about pharma coming in Schedule three, all of that, because you know people are voting right now. They'd rather get something illegal, or mm -hmm. if they, in the medical state legal, than they would go get a pharmaceutical because the pharmaceutical simply doesn't work.
Um, so I don't think there's going to be a problem there uh, down the road. Well, Sorry for wandering not, on the answer. Line. No, there's not going to be a problem with the trap, but there's definitely going to be a problem with a regulated marketplace. I think uh, the regulated marketplace will continue to sell cannabis flower. How, how, uh, how, how would they be able to, Dr. Talleyrand, with, with what Dr. Mark says in regards with all Schedule Three drugs have to be produced in these uh, FDA-approved facilities? Right. It wouldn't be considered a Schedule Three drug. It wouldn't have gone through FDA facilities. It'll simply go to the state's local uh, DCC, you know, and get approved that way, just like it's getting approved right now. I don't. I don't see how they're gonna. How the FDA is gonna let that fly? I'm not buying that one. Well, they're letting it fly now. <laughs> well, they're, they're only letting it fly now because they don't have jurisdiction because it's a Schedule One drug. Once they have Schedule Three, then they have full jurisdiction. Once they're told to look and pay attention, and it's your job, suddenly it's their job, and exactly. we just don't know what they're gonna do with that. And how? How in the current day and age? of opiates and fentanyl and the crackdown and the necessary crackdown on, on, on when, when I, when I'm studying what is going to happen to cannabis and juxtapose it to the behaviors that they are currently taking, the roles that they are, are undertaking with, with these other pill manufacturing problems, how do you then say, oh, well, we're just going to ignore where do they draw that line? I, mm -hmm. it's, it boggles my mind. Yep. Okay. I think you, one you, of the other you gotta things remember, is you got to remember what is approved by the FDA are single active ingredient medicines, mm -hmm. which is basically a cannabinoid inside a matrix of inactive ingredients. If the cannabis plant teaches us anything, it teaches us many things. But if Mishulam's work really teaches us anything, it teaches us that the activity of whole flower is not just in one compound. It's in all the compounds that are in the flower. That's what Schedule 1. That's not Schedule Schedule three, right? Flower is schedule one. They've deemed it having no medical value or and, and that it's highly addictive. But where that flies in the face of reality is that several active ingredients that are derived from the plant have now been approved by the FDA. But we do know that, yes, the FDA packaging CBD or packaging THC into a pill is never, never going to provide the efficacy that the whole plant is going to provide. And things like full spectrum extracts, what people typically call RSO, I don't like to glorify Rick in his method of making full spectrum extracts, which is basically taking cannabis and lighter fluid and boiling it in a crock pot in your garage. That's not cool. But full spectrum extracts, which have flavonoids and the terpenes and the full range of cannabinoids are going to have much more efficacy against cancer, against PTSD. It doesn't surprise me that the single isolated active doesn't have uh, activity against PSD. PSTD and and John, you, you know this that that the synthetic version uh, Marinol is a racemic mixture of both the right-handed and left-handed versions of the molecule, where only one of them works. So right away. 50% of that stuff is not going to work because the body only recognizes one of those molecules, not both of them. The other thing that I would say is that, again, if you're going to take a compound through clinical trials, you're going to spend an awful lot of money doing it. The reason why pharmaceutical companies have to spend a lot of money to get those things through clinical trials is because they have the molecule patented. So they're the only ones that can produce it. And by taking that molecule through the clinical trials, they own the clinical registration for that investigative new drug. And they need to have a certain amount of sales on the other side of that approval to basically pay for the cash hole that they dug in getting there. There is no place for the pharmaceutical companies to play in cannabinoid-based medicine unless they're inventing new molecules, right? So all those hemp-derived molecules like HHCP and all those things, those things could have clinical efficacy, but they need to be studied and taken through FDA clinical trials. There is no play for the pharmaceutical companies with plant-based medicine, right? Because they can't pack in the active ingredient because these are public compositions that are known and have been known for years what they what they 
they they do. So there's really no play for big pharma with the plant. None. Zero. I mean, here's here's what I would just sort of overlay with all of this, right? Euphoria, dysphoria, somebody's high is another person's cry. We know that there are over 150 cannabinoids. And we are from high school calculus, you know, the more variables there is in an equation, the harder it is to solve for it. And when I went to Canatech in Israel years ago, some guys and gals in little white coats said that not only was there all of these different variables and in their interactions between each other with a full plant uh, compounds or extracts, uh, but also that different types of extraction and different form factors would also affect those ratios. So, you know, separate from the crock pot of RSO, it's not crock pot thinking to know that the notion that the, the, the more you can replicate what actually is in the plant when it's being put into a patient's body, probably the better. That's how God and nature intended it. Um, but, but, but separate from all of that, I think what gets missed in this conversation around the science is the notion that cannabis is just about medical. And so cannabis is about homeostasis and wellness and about people having the opportunity to self-adjust their endocannabinoid system. And we wouldn't have an endocannabinoid system unless maybe we might want to have some endocannabinoids in us. Now, I'm exploring the endocanine system and the way in which my dog makes me feel euphoria, but that's for a different podcast. So I just think that as we talk about the medical efficacy, it's important to also acknowledge that separate from medical efficacy and separate from how long it's going to take for us to crack the code and really understand this plant at a more deeper granular level, people should be able to self-regulate, self-medicate, self-recreate, and that that is, is, is a part of the equation that gets missed when we more myoptically look at this through the lens of what can we prove through the Western medicine model currently. Mm-hmm. And on well that, we said. really, 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 it's really hope for wellness, not just for sickness. Thank yeah. you for bringing us back to that. And on that, we're going to go to a commercial and we're going to be right back. 